Okay. <clears throat> Good. Well, hopefully, we'll give us feedback on the breakout rooms. Uh, always looking for better ways to connect people and, and help you move along. Uh, so let's go to the second part of tonight. Um, I want to talk, for those taking the course for credit, just to remind you, it's uh, 15.393. It's three units of pass-fail. Two requirements, class attendance. So there, you won't learn a lot from people if you're not hearing them. And uh, secondly, there's a written requirement, and which can be an executive summary or a pitch deck of an idea you're thinking about or a team you've joined. We do encourage team formation to make this useful to you, make it more real life. Uh, a team of 10 is probably not the right number, but anywhere from three to five would work. Um, if you'll email your team mates to the TAs by Saturday night, if you need help finding a team, also um, you know, email, we'll try to link you up. Um, and I would encourage you to try to join a team of some sort. Um, it, you'll get much more from that. So with that, Bob Jones, finding your customer. Well, <clears throat> Bob has many things that he's done over the years, um, including starting a number of companies. He was a became a springboard dive, diver in sort of mid-career and was nationally ranked. But for people at MIT in the Sloan School, he was the founder of the consumption function, something he may talk about either tonight or next week. And um, he's also uh, Blues Dogs is his, uh, his band when he's not doing all the other stuff he's doing, uh, including uh, playing at uh, homeless shelters, I think, Bob. But let me turn it over to you. and. Um, you can say whatever else you'd like to say, and uh, your uh, salaries again tripled from last year. Oh my God, an embarrassment of riches. Um, would you set it up so that I can share the screen, Joe, if you haven't already? Uh, I believe you did. Okay. There we go. We're good. Yep. Well, <clears throat> good evening, everybody. And, uh, uh, my compliments to you for having the good sense to sign up for this course. It's clearly impossible to teach uh, what everyone should know about entrepreneurship and starting a venture in just six nights. But uh, I'm involved in a fair number of these um, sessions about the country. And I have to tell you that Joe's course comes closer than anything else I've ever been exposed to. It's pretty intense. So. I want to echo his remarks. Uh, you won't get a hell of a lot out of it if you don't attend. Uh, if you do attend, um, it will be drinking from the fire hose. Uh, you will find uh, some of this stuff doesn't make sense to you for a couple of years. We do get letters from people saying, I was in the class five years ago, and, and they tell us something. Um, I looked through uh, the sign-up sheet a couple of days ago because I was curious. Uh, not only who had signed up, but why. And uh, it, was, it was quite the spread of interest. Um, a fair number of people said, well, I want to learn about new adventures. Fine, that's what school's for. Um, one person says she's co-founded a startup with an MIT alum and seeking guidance on some of the early stage issues. Uh, you are more likely to succeed, Jen Schaefer than um, many people who plunge into entrepreneurship because you're doing your research now rather than after you've run into a buzzsaw. Nice going. So there are people interested in real estate, robotics. Uh, one person had a deep passion for food. Somebody interested in the elderly tech community. A couple people here from Tufts. One of you ran across my pal, Jay Mixter, who told you to take this course. So be sure to call him back and tell him it's fabulous. Um, translational medicine, uh, food, ag startups. So this is quite the spread. So as a, your presenter this evening, I asked myself, well, how can I possibly provide anything that's relevant given a spectrum that's that broad? And uh, the, the unifying factor across all of those things is that none of them will succeed if they don't have customers. 
And that's our topic for this evening. But it's one thing to read this list of stuff, and it's quite another to hear it from the founders themselves. So, uh, Enzi, if I remember, uh, Eski, pardon me, if I remember correctly, we have somebody named Allison who's uh, willing to give us a short version of what she's up to. Can you find Willing her? might be a sum <laughs> an assumption, but definitely we received a fantastic pitch from Allison. All right, Allison, are you uh, uh, with us? Well, stuff happens. Just scrolling so, through here, Rob, I don't see an Allison on the call. I might be missing it, but um, I, don't, I don't see them on the call. All right. Well, uh, we can either skip pitches, and women and children won't die if we do that, um, or we can ask if there's anybody out there feeling bold, feeling bold enough to Tell us for 30 or 60 seconds a little bit about uh, the business that they have started or are contemplating starting. I will do it. Volunteer myself. <laughs> oh, there you are. Okay. What's your name? Amy. Okay, Amy, take it away. Okay. So how many of you love music and dance? All right. How Did many you know of us what? Say that again. How many of us what? How many of you love music and dance? Did you know Korean Heart Therapy improves quality of life for cancer patients by 50%? Why do I know that? Because music and dance help me recover from stage four cancer. So I'm building an AI powered telehealth platform with a mission to make healthy habits accessible, supportive and fun by matching you to the most compatible buddy and help you build fun, healthy habits from the comfort of your home. <laughs> okay, thank you, Amy. So you, the unmet need that you have identified is a, a better um, approach toward recovering from cancer. And your solution to that, if I'm hearing, hearing you correctly, your solution to that is a combination of music and dance, which is not only fun, uh, it's also energizing and uh, has been demonstrated. I'll put words in your mouth, demonstrated to improve the convalescence. So far, so good? Yes. Okay, who's going who's gonna to pay you for this? Um, our long-term business model is Medicare Advantage Fund reimbursement. Um, we also directly sell to elder care, uh, B2B, as that would be cancer. And we soon realize dancing actually impacts you know, reduce risk of dementia, and then also cardiovascular death by 46%. Yeah, so we expand beyond just, uh, just cancer. So is your economic pitch that by virtue of buying your product or service, people will save money over time, the facilities providing the service will save money, or are you selling to the individuals and saying this will help you convalesce from this terrible condition? Yeah, we wanted to maximize the opportunity for beneficiaries. So ideally, that's do insurance reimbursement. It could also be sponsored by corporate wellness programs or family health care plans or individuals who wanted to support an elderly or chronic disease patients, whether that's their family members or, you know, other income donations. All right. Thank you. We could have a much longer conversation. I know a little something about what it takes to get reimbursed for something like this. You, you have a long bumpy road ahead of you. Uh, you, you. You will probably triumph, but it won't be easy. Uh, to be continued. Anybody else wanna go with this or shall we just dive right in? I'd be right. happy. Well, nope, somebody else? Oh, I'd be happy to make a pitch. Um. All right. And Over here. I don't see you on my screen. So, who are you? Um, Rosetta. My name is Rosetta. Okay, Rosetta. And um, my venture is about energy in Antarctica. And um, basically, in Antarctica, um, they have um, stations, like many governments have stations in Antarctica. Um, and there's a lot of research that occurs down there and everything's fueled by, um, diesel engines that 
use kerosene or jet fuel. And um, the venture is about selling energy that um, is produced by fuel cell um, and in hydrogen. Um, Okay, so you've identified an unmet need. <clears throat> you have a proposed solution. And um, is your customer likely to be the governments that have establishments there? Yeah, so we would be um, selling energy to government stations that are um, established in Antarctica. Um, many of those um, operate for scientific research purposes, um, mostly astronomy or geosciences. There's also a little bit of tourism, which is growing. Um, and a limiting factor for, you know, um, human um, establishments in Antarctica is definitely energy accessibility. Um, it's on the, in, in the interior, especially where there's no infrastructure. Um, so, um, later on, our hope is to sell fuel um, in the form of liquid hydrogen to um, a growing economy of uh, hydrogen fueled vehicles. Like um, there, um, you know, in the world have been uh, iterations of, you know, hydrogen airplanes and um, tractors and vehicles and other, um, you know, kinds of aircrafts and an ambition would to, would be to grow the hydrogen economy in a continent that, um, is most in need of, uh, a better source of fuel. Okay. Thank you, Rosetta. A, a quick commercial, ladies and gentlemen, we are going to focus on presenting your venture, um, a week from tonight. Uh, because it's a, it's an art form associated with how do you boil all this stuff down into a compelling pitch, begins with a hook, follows up with substance, and has a stirring conclusion. And we will work on that a little bit for next week. For uh, this evening, uh, Rosetta, I salute you um, for a, a noble idea. I, I think there's a world of questions to be asked. Like if you had every bit of this market, would it add up to $1.98? and not be worth the trouble? Uh, can, can you do it so that the revenues exceed your costs? Is there any possibility of growth rate, et cetera? But hold all of those things, because I've got to talk to give. <laughs> so thank you. So, uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, I also noticed, ladies and gentlemen, as I read through the uh, list of people, that a fair number of them said, well, I don't know anything about entrepreneurship and innovation, and I'd like to explore that. And um, I think that's a brilliant idea. I feel uh, honor bound to tell you that you may not want to do this. Um, I am in the course of writing a book called The Startup Starter Kit, which will be published this September. And in that context, I've been interviewing entrepreneurs uh, besides myself. Um, and here are a few quotes that have popped up just in the past week. Uh, Trevor said, uh, when I became an entrepreneur at age 26, um, I was on the front page of the newspaper in my city. I had a beautiful girlfriend. I had a brand new BMW and I had the world by the horns. A year later, I had lost everything. My car was repossessed. I was single. I was living in my parents' basement and working as an assistant manager at Radio Shack. Trevor, by the way, is successful these days, but hold that thought. Uh, here's Mike, uh, founder and CEO of uh, an internet provider service in the Midwest. And he said, when I became an entrepreneur, I didn't have the education to really even understand what that meant. I was really good at a couple of things. And by the way, his career took off like a rocket while he was in corporate America. But I didn't know how many other things I needed to know. I said, well, Micah, you think this is a, a lifestyle for everybody? Nope, I don't think it's for everyone. I think it's excruciatingly difficult. There were many times I was put in positions where, man, your very existence is questioned by investors, by board members, by employees. 
So of course I asked a, an obvious question, which is, would you do it again? Trevor said, you know, it took me three years to get the taste of failure out of my mouth and I have never forgotten it. So yes, but it did take me three years. I said, why? And he said, well, most people, why would you do it again? Most people trade their dreams for security. And in my world, there's nothing out there worth trading your dreams for. Right. People like Trevor, and for what it's worth me, are probably uh, mentally ill. Um, but this is a mindset that drives people to do it over and over again. I said, Mike, if you were allowed to go back in time and had a chance to do it all over again, would you? And he said, if I was allowed to go back in time, I would probably spend a weekend in prayer asking God to find someone else. But yes, I'd do it again. Well, I continued to interview these people and others and said, what would have made it easier for you? What would have improved your odds, given that our friend Joe told us earlier this evening, the great majority of these things fail? And there were two things. One was kind of a surprise, and that was a healthy level of fear, which I'm only going to talk about briefly. And the other was improving your skills in certain basic areas. Here's a hint. Take this course. Let's talk just a moment about the role of fear. Don't worry, I'm not going to get all metaphysical on you or anything, but uh, it is, I mean, it came up in these conversations. It is worth talking about. If you have too little fear, if you walk into this situation thinking, I got this, it's nothing to worry about here, um, that low level of fear allows you to do truly dumb stuff. Obviously, too much fear leaves you too paralyzed to do much of anything. The right level of fear and anxiety keeps you always looking about for things that could trip you up. The more I talked to these folks, the more I concluded that, in fact, there was a relationship between fear and performance, which could be graphed. So I called up my inner nerd and I drew this. And I think as fear, increases, your performance increases up to a point, and then it drops like a stone. And so our goal should be to keep you in this highly productive area here, which leads us to the basic skills that you should have. And there's a few of them, not an overwhelmingly long list. You should understand who's your customer. You should understand how will you make money. There will be organizational and people issues because once you've got this product market fit that everyone talks about, your team is everything. There will be legal issues you'll have to wrestle with, particularly if there's real money on the table. You should know how to sell and how to make presentations. And many people break out in hives when they hear this concept. And so for you, I... I encourage you to come next week. We will take some of the fear out of this, but it's, in my view, an essential skill. One day, somebody will sit down and say, I don't want to pay as much as you want to charge me. You need negotiating skills, and you need to understand finances. And by the way, that list has boiled up over and over again in talking with people who are doing it, and it's not, therefore, a coincidence that that's your curriculum for these six nights. And we did not take an academic, lofty, top-down perspective and say, well, here's what we think you should know. We talked to people who failed over and over again and say, why'd you fail? And what was it you didn't know? Here's the list. So with that, my agenda for this evening is the introduction, which we've already done. I'm going to try to provide you with a few hot tips to find your customers and succeed with your business. I'm going to walk you through a couple of product launches that I was associated with, and I'm going to ask your help to help me distill out some lessons that you may have learned, and God knows I hope I've learned. A few minutes for question and answer, and we'll wrap it up by 9 o'clock. And a quick word on my background. Um, the book will be published in September. 
I've started four healthcare companies. I uh, did a stretch with a fairly normal job. Uh, I was CEO of a company that's publicly traded on the Hong Kong exchange. Terrible mess. It was a turnaround. Uh, had to fire a lot of people and replace them, upgrade the staff. A longer story. I've had a couple normal jobs. I went to school uh, a couple times. Uh, and as Joe pointed out, I'm a regular working musician. In fact, I made my living as a guitar player for a year before I broke down and went to business school. Um, and one of the things that I'm doing still to this day is uh, I'm part of a group that volunteers to play and sing in homeless shelters. Here's a picture of one in Quincy where I spent most of Thanksgiving Day. I was the nerdy guitar player in the corner playing dinner music while they fed almost a thousand people. So, um, so I'm a soft touch for stuff like that. Okay, during a recession some years ago, a lot of companies failed, a few succeeded. The Wall Street Journal did an assessment of who succeeded and who failed. And there were two success strategies. One was these companies became cost leaders. They aggressively cut their costs. That's not you. And the other is they were innovators and they focused on building brands. When you work with a lofty technologically oriented institution like MIT, it's tempting to think that it has to be artificial intelligence heuristics and et cetera, but it's not true. There's 50 kids in town who want a bicycle and there's no bicycle shop, your end user is dissatisfied. And there's your opportunity. So I'm gonna make a couple of bold assertions here. Uh, one is your business might survive, but it's not gonna prosper until you know what you're really selling. And it might be security. It might be some soft concept that is divorced from the technology, God bless you. Um, <laughs> you need to know what are you really selling you need to know who wants it not who needs it but who wants it and how do i find it? and much more which i will be elaborating on there's some fundamental questions you should ask regarding your venture and these i think are deceptive because they seem really simple i'm willing to bet that most of you who are on this call tonight who have ventures can't answer most of these questions What's the unmet need that we address? Who cares? That's not a rhetorical question. Specifically, who out there wants to fix this problem? And uh, Rosetta, vis-a-vis -vis you, for example, how many of them are there? Are there 12 people in all of North America who actually care about this? In which case you have a hobby, but not a company. Will they spend money to solve the problem? How do I find them? How do I let them know about us? How are they solving the problem now? By the way, if they're not spending money to solve it now, it's probably not a problem. It might be an irritation, but it's probably not a problem. And why is what I have something that they will think is better? Not what I, the psychotic founder, thinks is better. What will they think is better? And exactly who's going to pay me? And if I run the numbers, am I going to make any money? There's a whole bunch of you folks who've signed up this evening and you're interested in social uh, entrepreneurship. I do a little work in that arena. I have to tell you, it's twice as hard because if you want to give away one pair of shoes for every pair you sell, you have to make a lot of profit on the ones that you do sell so that you can support your noble idea. So exactly who will pay me and can I make any money is a relevant question. And just a quick sidebar, we're not going to talk much about raising capital, but most investors know that most of their investments are going to lose money. And they look at all of you guys and they say, well, you're smart, charming and lovable and kind to animals, uh, but most of you are going to fail. So my goal is to, as a prospective investor, to determine whether or not you have a chance of succeeding in your business. There's only one non-negotiable requirement. You've got to have customers. You don't have to be smart. You don't have to have money. You don't have to be good looking. You got to have customers. If you have customers, you will look smart. You'll make money. And forgive me, uh, I lived in Los Angeles for a while. And there, if you made enough money, people would think you're good looking. <laughs> Sorry, that's cynical. Uh, <laughs> therefore, 
the relevant questions here are, do you have any customers? Will you have any customers? Do you even know that you need them? And that sounds preposterous, preposterous, but you'd be astonished how many times I've sat with venture mentoring services and listened to somebody talk about how fabulous their technology is. And we say, well, yeah, but who's going to buy it from you? Oh, well, let me tell you how sophisticated my algorithm is. Yeah, but who's going to pay you? Oh, my God, I'm using this incredibly sophisticated technology. Right. So how will you get them? And when you get them, how much are they worth? If you need to make a million dollars this year, you're going to have one customer who pays you a million dollars. You're going to have a million customers who pay you one dollar. How much are they worth? How many of them do you need? How long is it going to take you to get them? So I think there's two descriptors that you want. You would like to be unique. You'd like to be important. The sweet spot is, of course, to be both. So examples. Well, I think most of us will agree that air is probably important, arguably not very unique. And I don't want anybody on this call to burst into tears uh, here, but many normal people would argue that MIT decals are unique, but not terribly important. So this raises a question, and, and I actually want an answer from you guys. Can you build a business selling air? Okay, Amy says no. Anybody else? All right. Well, any of you guys ever been scuba diving? Um, I did my checkout dive off Catalina Island, California. Got a little enthusiastic, went down about 100 feet. Stupid. Shouldn't have done it. Swimming through the kelp beds. Looked at the little gizmo on my wrist and thought, you know, I pay a lot of money right now for more air. So there is an opportunity. And ditto, if I said to you, I've got a product that it's going to cost me seven or eight cents to make, and I can sell it for five to ten dollars. You'd say, I don't think so. I'd say, well, yeah, there's a group of people out there who will pay that. So the point, and I admit I'm being a little tongue in cheek here, is positioning becomes very important. Figure out who will find your offering to be important and unique. Figure out how to find them. Tell them about your offering and take their money, okay? Let's give you an example. This was a product launch I was involved with some years ago. I was uh, running the clinical nutrition division of a California medical company. When I joined, the company was doing 200 million in annual revenue. It was taken private in a leverage buyout by an entrepreneur working with Alex Brown. He said, I want to bump the revenues up 50% in three years. Company had been 200 million for 12 straight years. It's kind of sleepy. He said, I want to bump it up $300 million and then take it public. Fired most of the senior management team, brought in people that had a little bit of energy and maybe weren't dead from the neck up and gave everybody some stock. So we go public, everybody's going to make a little money. The nutrition division that I ran was very profitable. We would make a leader of solution that we would sell to intensive care units. We'd make it for $3 and sell it for 70. So made a lot of money. I was running it. And unfortunately, I uh, have this bad habit of talking to customers. And I figured out there were some changes coming in the market and our business was going to go away which would threaten our ability to go public, which would affect everybody's net worth. So I clearly felt some pressure to find a new opportunity. I looked about, I found one, and it turned out to be potentially a way to reposition the whole corporation. We would be the first in the country to do this. By the way, that should send up a very large red flag for those of you who are contemplating something like this. Okay? First in the country, famous last words. But call that thought. I knew something about the renal failure market as a function of the work I had done at Baxter. And at the time, uh, in the US, there were 400,000 dialysis patients. What happens, your kidneys fail, and you have to go in and essentially 
run your blood through a glorified oil filter. It takes three or four hours, and you have to do this a couple times a week. Uh, tragically, the market was rapidly growing, but all of the patients were at a, one of the 2,300 dialysis centers in the country, which were all in a federal public present, uh, document. So I could find them. And because one of the things your kidneys do is help you eliminate fluid, you can't do what so many of us casually do, which is drink liquids all day long. They were fluid restricted. They were, for other reasons, other functions that your kidneys perform, they were clinically malnourished and they needed nutrition supplements. Here's where the problem came in. They needed nutrition supplements. They were fluid restricted and all of the supplements were liquids. Think Insure, stuff like that. So we looked at that and said, well, geez, that's bad. Why don't we come up with something that's high in what they ought to have and low in what they shouldn't have and doesn't have any liquids? In other words, a candy bar. So we created something and we had this ethical question, does it work? We ran a clinical trial. Those of you who know California will know Kaiser Permanente. We ran the trial with them. We got the results published in a peer reviewed journal and the bottom line was the silly thing worked. It improved the health of our patients. We said, well, all right, we know how to do this forecasting and market planning. We know the medical world. These patients see a doctor and they see a dietitian. And this world is hierarchical. There are opinion leaders at the top that think, I don't know, God and the apostles or whatever is your analogy. Um, so let's go talk to the opinion leaders. And so we asked the physicians, would you recommend it? We asked the dietitians, would you recommend it? And they all said, yeah. In fact, most of them said, geez, I wish I'd thought of this. We said, how do we stack up against the competition? They said, well, really, you don't have any. You're the only one that doesn't have any fluids. We said, well, how many of your patients would you recommend this for? And they said, all of them. Well, how many days a week would you recommend that they do this? And they said, seven. How do you feel about $3 a bar? That sounds pretty good. So we did some math and said, my God, this is pretty exciting. It's a genuine opportunity for the corporation. We'll have this market to ourselves. IPO, here we come. So we developed the marketing materials. We trained our sales force. We brought in the photographers and did the beauty shots. We made the product and off we went to the market. And it was a complete disaster. Just an absolute bomb. Our revenues every month came in at less than 10% of what we forecast. This raises a question. What did I do wrong? This is your turn to answer, by the way. So I'm just going to sit here while you guys think about this and then kindly volunteer, raise your hand or whatever. I'll, I'll trust our TAs to pick a couple of you out. Tell me what I did wrong. Why did this flop? Too early. I'm sorry? Too early. Too early? Well, people were dying all the time. I, I, hard to argue we were too early. Who was We're supposed possibly. to pay for that, by the way? Well, the patients. And at $3 a bar, we didn't think that was an insurmountable hurdle. We also have some answers in the chat log. We've got customer lie, taste, taste bad. Customers are the patients, not the physicians. Interesting. No actual no. user trials. You didn't ask the payers. Not covered in insurance. It does go on and on. <laughs> there's, there's a lot of answers. Yeah, I, I'm sorry, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'm mentally handicapped and I am unable to track the track the chat rooms while I do this. So thank you, uh, Esgi. Um, we thought it tasted pretty good. It turns out, however, that when your kidneys fail, your palate shifts and protein where tastes like spoiled meat. And one of the things that the product needed to have was a lot of protein. So that was an oops. Um, well, somebody in the chat room hit it right on the head, which is that we were used to the pharmaceutical model. 
where if the doctor writes a prescription for five days of an antibiotic for junior's earache, it doesn't matter whether junior likes it or not, take it and shut up. And if you're in the sales business, if the doc says, yeah, I'll write for it, you're done. Not true in this world because the clinicians don't buy it and they don't eat it. Oops. When we finally talked to the patients, they didn't want it and they couldn't afford it. Well, why didn't they want it? Since we had clear evidence that it would improve their lives and extend their lives. And I will save you the speculation. A question we should have asked was who gets kidney failure? It turns out that 44% of them get there from a lifetime of mismanaging their high blood pressure, and 33% get there from a lifetime of mismanaging their diabetes. So literally three quarters of the, our target market spent their whole lives neglecting themselves. They weren't going to change. Why couldn't they afford it? Well, because if they're tethered to a machine three times a week for half a day at a pop, usually some well-intended social worker would come along and say, well, we're going to put you on public aid. And so you have a limited income. And given your lifestyle choices, if you've got five extra dollars, you're going to spend it on beer and cigarettes and not on my product. There's one other issue which may not have crossed your mind, which is the retailers wouldn't carry it. Well, we hadn't thought about distribution as a part of competitive strategy, but trust me, it's incredibly important. We had been selling to hospitals who had intensive care units, et cetera. We had no traction in the world of retail pharmacies. And we just failed utterly to get in there. And I was completely perplexed by this until finally one day, a kindly pharmacist put his arm around my bony shoulders and said, Bob, come here. So you see this foot of shelf space? I've got all these algorithms that are going to tell me within a couple of dollars each month how much revenue I'm going to earn from that foot of linear foot of shelf space. Now, if I sweep your product off the shelf, I'm sorry, if I sweep the existing product off the shelf and put your product on the shelf, I can't think any reason why I should lose any money. So write me a check. This is called slotting fees. Uh, you might call it extortion. Uh, but the uh, dollar figures at the time were quite onerous. It was for CVS at the time, it was a million dollars a quarter, plus 6% of your top line revenue, plus it's a guaranteed sale. So if it doesn't sell, they send it back to you for a full refund. Plus, you have to fill the entire pipeline of all other stores with a couple of units of each in each of the stores for free. And then if anybody reorders it, they'll pay you eventually. <sighs> so. Quick sidebar, we were trying to show Wall Street we were a good candidate for a public offering. And if that went through, we would each own stock that was worth some money. We had friends who were saying, ooh, I'm gonna buy a boat, et cetera. And my shortfall jeopardized this. And of course, on a personal embarrassment level, we had senior management meetings every month. We'd gather about a dozen of us around the table in a big conference room. Everybody would report on how their business was going. And they'd say, Bob, your forecast was $400,000 for this past month. How'd you do? And I'd say, 30. They'd say, wait, I must have misunderstood you. You didn't say $30,000 against the forecast of 400, did you? Yeah. So it was embarrassing, to say the least. And every month I would say, well, you know, we've not done this before. We're gaining traction in the market. Ride with us a little bit longer, et cetera. But we didn't. It just got worse and worse. And suffice to say that it ruined a whole year of my life. What we knew about it? Well, eventually we learned about inside sales. We said we can reach the 25% of people who developed kidney failure because they were in a car accident or whatever, and we'll sell to them, patient publications. Uh, we can get reimbursed through Medicaid. You probably know that Medicaid is different from one state to the next. And 
uh, take a wild guess how probable it is that Massachusetts will have the same reimbursement regulations as Connecticut. I don't think so. So this wasn't quite as much fun as having 40 consecutive root canals and eventually said, this is just a terrible way to make a living. We found an outfit that specialized in these patients. They had identified those who were willing to spend money and we sold the business for them for about a dollar more than we'd spent on it. Sidebar, yes, I overachieved with my other responsibilities. We did go public and I emerged from the doghouse, but it was a very bad year. Okay, example number two. Fast forward a couple of years, and just to show you that entrepreneurship is kind of synonymous with being deranged. I, I launched a couple more of these things, did rather better, got to know uh, the docs at Harvard Med School, though I was in California, and um, moved to Boston, started a company with these folks. We looked about at the various areas we could work in and we selected diabetes as our field because I had some insights about an unmet need for this customer group. So I'm gonna get into the weeds a little bit here with you because it's important and it sets the stage for the marketing story that follows. At the time, and this world has changed since we did this. So uh, those of you who are on the call who in fact have diabetes or have a family member with diabetes, uh, you will recognize that this has changed somewhat. At the time, there were 10 million people diagnosed with it. And the general sentiment was that once you get it, you can manage it, but you can never cure it. The goal of diabetes is to keep your blood sugar from going too high or too low. In other words, to restrict the bandwidth of the fluctuation. And 4 million of those 10 million people at the time injected insulin to bring their blood sugar back down. And everybody who injects insulin, at the time anyway, who injected insulin to lower their blood glucose was at risk of having it go too low. This is called hypoglycemia. So what usually gets people's attention in the world of diabetes is the blood glucose being too high for too long, which causes blindness, kidney failure, and amputation of your extremities, usually your feet sometimes your leg. This takes time and happens over a period of time. Hypoglycemia, dropping too low, has to be treated right away because you faint. And that's awkward if you're in a traffic jam somewhere. Um, and it's particularly pernicious if you become hypoglycemic at night because you can go from being asleep to being in a coma. So typically, well, Back up, in the course of a normal day, people who are managing their diabetes at the time would typically eat three meals, three small snacks, regular small injections of insulin and uh, titrate everything proportionately. At night, that system would break down because nobody was gonna wake themselves up twice a night to eat something and inject. So they typically ate a big nighttime snack, took a big injection of insulin and hoped that the two would balance through the evening and it didn't work because all of the food were turning to glucose at the same time. So the spike was higher, the duration was no longer. And the translation of all that was that at about two in the morning, the food would run out and the insulin was still working and that was the danger zone. You guys know what focus groups are? Yes, okay. Focus groups, you bring in a bunch of people that whose opinions you want to know, prospective customers, ideally, you stay on the other side of the one-way glass, you hire a moderator to ask them questions. After about the third one of these, I had a little temper tantrum and emerged from the other side of the glass and said, all right, you guys have spent the last 45 minutes talking about all this. Tell me what your greatest fear is. And they said, I'm afraid that I'll die in my sleep. I don't sleep in my bed anymore. I sleep in that recliner in my living room because I'm afraid that if I get too comfortable, I will never wake up. So, ooh, well, that's not intellectual, that's gripping. And for those people who were parents of a nine or 10 year old, they worried every night that their little Jessica 
had slipped from being asleep to being in a coma. And I heard many stories from parents who said, you know, you only need to have the EMT come to your house to revive your child once and you never forget it. So we put together something called Night Bite, which was a collection of ingredients that turned into glucose all night long. And of course, I being fundamentally a marketer, promptly dubbed it time to release glucose. We got a patent on it. Pretty slick. It tasted rather like a chocolate brownie. That was a good thing. And we gave it a non-medical name and non-medical packaging. Would any of you care to speculate as to why we did that? User friendly. Uh, well, that's a lovely them. phrase. What does that mean? Jared, you were going to add to that? Well, kids in particular are they hate medicine, right? So uh, this just is a, something that overcomes that barrier and just makes it all the easier to get their kids to want. Well, if the kids are going to go have a sleepover at somebody's house and they got to eat one of these things, the last thing they want to do is look like they're taking medicine. And so this stuff, I mean, you're spot on. This stuff, they could pass it around to their friends. Their friends would say, geez, that's pretty good. You got another one? And the grown-ups that we talked with said, Bob, I don't think of myself as a diabetic. I'm a banker. I'm a lawyer. You know, these folks over here get migraines. I've got diabetes and I manage it. And if I'm in a meeting that's running late and I need to do this, it's nobody's damn business whether or not I have diabetes. I certainly don't want to look like I'm medicating. We said, all right, so what should we make it look like? He said, well, make it look like, you know, something that an elite athlete would consume. I said, ooh. So this phrase for the nutritional management of hypoglycemia caused us to actually sell some to marathon runners. Why not, right? So, so our business planning, this time around, we talked not only with clinicians, but also with parents and with patients. We had focus groups. We went to support group meetings at the local elementary school and sat in those chairs that were about this big. And um, but like baby Huey, listening to parents talk about their life with their childhood, their diabetes, et cetera. We learned a lot. We picked an ad agency that was familiar with diabetes and who improved considerably on the usual ads. And at the time people were reading, people with diabetes were reading one of several magazines that were dedicated to this. So we started running ads and the ad would have a little violator across the corner, call 1-800-NIGHT-BITE uh, for a sample of our product. And when we started getting 100 calls a day, we said, we need more phones. At 200 calls a day, we said, we better get somebody to answer the silly things. And we were in Kendall Square in Cambridge at the time. There's more geniuses per square foot there than most places. So we'd walk out on the street, check people's pulse and say, well, you seem to be alive. Would you like a job? 300 calls a day, we started, we figured we better put something up, put a database together. At 500 calls a day, you said, we said, you know, we might be onto something here. Let's actually hire some people and train them. And to fast forward, and I will come back and fill in some of the blanks, we ended up in every major pharmacy chain in the country. We were stocked with all the major wholesalers, and we paid zero in slotting fees. And we became an obscure Harvard Business School case study because nobody had done this before. And the lesson was that understanding our customer helped us invent a better product and helped us build a successful business. Let me elaborate a little bit. We said a lot of people that have diabetes don't take care of themselves and they darn sure don't spend any money to take care of themselves. So how do we find the ones who do take care of themselves and who are spending money? To whom do they look for advice? Do they read stuff? I mean, who out there do they believe, given that the world is full of self-appointed experts? 
And we essentially learned that there was a credential called a certified diabetes educator. This is a credential that comes usually on top of being a nurse, a pharmacist, sometimes a dietitian, usually located around the major metropolitan areas and they charge more. And they have an association called, surprisingly enough, the American Association of Diabetes Educators. They have a tab that says locate an educator. When you click on 02142 and out comes everybody in that section of Cambridge along with their contact information. So we could find it. We asked ourselves, well, what do they worry about and how can we help? And answering that question ended up providing us with several thousand highly credentialed members of our sales force who were, worked for free. Let me elaborate on that. There's a very important idea that I don't have time tonight to elaborate on, but I want you to scribble this down somewhere as you grow your company. Who wins if you win? And who would love, therefore, to see you win? We figured out at the time that there were 12,000 CDEs who we could reach through the association. And most of them had a meeting once a month with all of their patients, usually Saturday mornings. They always needed new content. And we said, well, what do they care about? And we didn't know. So we said, well, let's call them up. So we started calling them up and saying, what's your biggest professional frustration? And the answer was, I tell my patients what to do, and they don't do it. We said, well, what if we told you that we've got a product invented by a group of docs in Harvard Med School that works, your patients will love it, they will take it regularly, and they will thank you for telling them about it. How would you feel about that? And most of the time, the answer was, are you kidding? I'd shout it from the rooftops. Well, if this passed your inspection, would you tell your patients? Yes, we would. We definitely would. And so we ended up with a couple thousand of these folks. They would have been insulted if we'd offered them money because they are healers. What we gave them was something else that really mattered to them, which is now their patients would listen to them. We said, by the way, do you have relationships with local pharmacies? They said, yes, we do. Will you tell your pharmacists that you're sending patients to them? Yes, we will. Well, pharmacists aren't going to tell them no. So in we went. No mention of slotting fees because we had, guess what? Customers. So we drew up a little flow chart. We said, how are we making money here? Well, we're calling the diabetes educators. They're telling the patients. The patients are at the moment buying from us and we learn some stuff. We learn reuse rates. We, you know, frequency of use, et cetera, et cetera. We're not really making any money. To make money, we're going to have to get into the retailers. So if the diabetes educators call the retailers, well, if we call the retailers, they're not going to take the call because every entrepreneur is clearly a liar and they're just not going to take the call. But if the educator calls the retailer, the patient calls the retailer, and then we call the retailer, we have an opportunity to make more money. So, and of course, serve more of these patients. So how do we do that? By the way, first note that our definition of our customer just evolved. Our customer was initially patients, then diabetes educators, now it's retailers. So far, so good? Okay. So we got these calls from consumers. And by the way, somehow or other, we ended up on a list that said this bunch is giving away free brownies because we said somewhere along the way that it tastes a little bit like a brownie. So we started getting all manner of inbound calls, people that have that damn thing to do with diabetes. So we learned we had to ask a qualifying question. What brand of insulin are you using? If they said, huh? And we say, sorry, we don't have anything for you. They got the right answer, we'd send them a free sample. And then we'd follow up. Did you get our product? Yes. Uh, 
Who knows the difference between an open-ended question and a closed-ended question? I hate Zoom sometimes. Jared, take it away. But you have to unmute though, what's the difference? Well, a uh, closed-ended question would be one that has a very succinct answer like, uh, is yes. the sky red right now? <laughs> no, okay. Open-ended, describe the sun. Brilliant, brilliant, thank you. You can skip the rest of the course. <laughs> well, we found that if we said, well, did you like it? And they said, no, that's a major oops. What do you do with that, right? So if we said, well, what was your reaction? They might say, well, I didn't much care for the taste. We'd say, okay, what else? Well, it worked great. Okay, what else? Well, I'd like some more. So we learned to ask open-ended questions. And we said, well, for a limited time, we will pay for the shipping if you'd care to order. We'd take their credit card and we'd send them off. And we tracked it because it was early days. And there weren't that many of them. We said, aren't you about out? Isn't it time to reorder? And they would say yes. And then after we had what we thought was critical mass, we started telling them, well, sorry, we can no longer afford to pay shipping. Wouldn't it be more convenient for you to buy this where you buy your insulin? And they would say, why, yes. We'd say, well, where is that? And they'd say, Hadzima's Pharmacy. And we'd say, great. May we call Mr. Hadzima and tell him that you're about to come in and look for some night bite. You bet. Tell that rascal I've been buying from him for seven or eight years now, and he better stock this stuff. Well, if you've ever watched a pharmacist answer the phone, it looks kind of like this. Pharmacy. About 12 seconds to get their attention. We timed this. So we'd say, Mr. Hedzema, we have a product that your customers want. They're going to come ask you for it. You don't have it. What can you, we do about that? And usually they'd stop and say, what? Who is this? <laughs> That's called permission to continue in sales parlance. And so we would continue. And pretty soon they'd say, all right, all right, all right. I guess I got to buy some of this stuff. But you know perfectly well that here at Walgreens, you know, we have corporate buying plans. And we can't buy this stuff without corporate approval. And we'd say, well, yes, we understand that, but we think that there's probably a threshold below which you can buy without corporate approval, and it's probably $100. And we'd say, well, yeah, actually, that's right. And we'd say, well, you'll be pleased to know that our starter kit costs $99.95. You have a question, Eski? There's a question from Raymond here. He's saying, just out of curiosity, is the snack bar exclusive? Only for consumers with diabetes can others who do not have pre-existing condition eat it without any side effects. <laughs> uh, well, a good question. Thank you. Um, uh, it's worth clarifying. I think it's no longer in the market. We sold it to an outfit and they ran it for about a decade and then it evaporated. But the answer at the time was anybody could eat it. In fact, we knew we had a hit on our hands when uh, the staff in the office kept eating our inventory. So, uh, yeah. It was, <laughs> it was perfectly okay. <laughs> so we would tell the guy, all right, place, give us your initial order. If it doesn't sell, you don't need to ship it back to us. Throw it, throw it in the trash. We'll take your word for it. We'll send you a refund. There's no risk. And after a couple of times, we ended up getting the corporate approval we wanted, and nobody ever mentioned slotting fees. Next step was we said, you know, these retailers have about 8,000 different products in their store. They do not want 8,000 invoices each month. So they buy from wholesalers. Wholesalers come in with these big Tupperware containers, usually in the middle of the night, and they've got greeting cards and cat food and toothpaste and penicillin and all of them, and they send one invoice. And we said, well, we're just not going to get to heaven until we get into the wholesalers. And then we will, in fact, broaden our reach. And that's another redefinition of our customer. 
So note that as we have evolved and grown our company, our customer definition has evolved and changed. So I'm not going to tell you how we got into the wholesalers because I'm keeping an eye on the time. But there is an interesting little sidebar story that I will tell you. Um, who knows what a planogram is in, a, in the retail world? Anybody? Okay, if you've ever walked into a Walgreens or a CVS, you'll notice that there are certain products that are always at about eye level in aisle seven and other products that are down around your ankles in aisle nine and that they're by and large standardized from one CVS to another, one Walgreens to another. They put together essentially a graphical layout called a planogram and they enforce it fairly strictly. And if you ever have the misfortune to go to Bentonville, Arkansas and arm wrestle with Walmart, you'll find that they have about a city block full of buildings where they construct their planograms. And they put a lot of analysis into this. We got a letter one day, honest to God, postal letter stamp on it, and said, we are constructing, this is a major pharmacy in the Southeast. We are constructing our planogram for the coming year. If you'd like to be in it, you must come to Clearwater, Florida for a 15 minute meeting during the week of. We said, wait, what? <laughs> and so um, we called about and said, who are we meeting with? And the answer was Jeff. What's Jeff's job? Jeff's job is one you don't want. He's got to listen to one pitch after another every 15 minutes from fevered vendors for a whole week. Well, you're right. I don't want that job. How is Jeff evaluated? Jeff is evaluated on how much money he can extort in form of slotting fees and promotional allowances, et cetera, from the people who want to be on their shelves. We thought about that and thought, well, we don't have any money. We're not going to give these jokers any money, but we feel pugnacious. Let's go. So we made our appointment for our 15 minute meeting. We flew to Florida and we sat in the lobby and honest to God, this was like Cirque du Soleil or something. I mean, there were people there with end caps and just all sorts of stuff um, showing all the wonderful things, you know, we will walk your dog, we'll pick up your dry cleaning, et cetera. And when our turn came, we went in and we sat down. It was just two of us in a briefcase. And we said, Jeff, this isn't going to be like any of your other 15-minute meetings this week because we don't have any money and we're not going to give you a nickel. But what we want to do is spend five minutes telling you who we are, five minutes telling you what the product is, and five minutes telling you why you want us in your stores. And he said, well, I could use a break. <laughs> it's your 15 minutes. Tear it up. So the first 10 minutes were pretty much what you would expect. The last five minutes, we started pulling sheets of paper out of the briefcase and said, these are the names of people with diabetes in the states where you have stores with whom we are doing business right now. There's 10,000 of them. Sidebar, it's worth pointing out that at the time, about 4% of the people in America had diabetes, and they were responsible for 23% of retail pharmacy purchases. Because I go in and buy toothpaste and a greeting card. They would go in and buy insulin, glucose strips, glucometers, et cetera. So these were high-value customers. So I said, we got 10,000 of them. We don't want to be in the business of distribution any longer. And they've all asked us the same question, which is which retailer can I go to to buy this stuff? So how would you like us to answer their question? Jeff sat back. He was quiet for about a minute. If you don't think that's a long time, hold your breath. <laughs> but we weren't going to say a word. And at the end of the minute, he said, all right, you're in. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the merit here, we did the work to get the customers. 
we just said slotting fees is our way of paying you to go get the customers. We're not going to do that. We got the customers. So you got the customers. You've got all manner of negotiating power. So the results grew like crazy. We had an extraordinarily high reorder rate. It was more than 300 times a year. We got a lot of publicity, got a fair number of offers to buy the business, and we sold it to a billion dollar pharmaceutical firm. Everybody's happy. Hard work, better than the regain story. So I'm about to turn this over to you for a few minutes anyway. I've had some painful experiences here. I've learned some lessons. Help me summarize them. Since I'm still in this game, what should I have learned from these experiences that might be relevant to helping me build my next sales model? So, as again, I'm going to rely on you to see who's raising their hand, et cetera. But give me some thoughts here, uh, ladies and gentlemen. What should I have learned from these and similar experiences in the marketplace launching? new products. Go, Jared. We've got Jared, yep. No, oh, right. Oh, so you, you saw me, okay. I did. So uh, know your customer and most specifically know that they're actually willing to pay for what you think they want. Okay, that's important. Thank you. Um, well, We've I see also got somebody... Jennifer here. Okay, Jennifer, let's hear it. What should I have learned from all this? Validate any assumptions you have about your customer with the actual customer. <laughs> right, somebody shoot me if I don't learn that lesson. <laughs> Thank you. I clearly did not know it with the first one with Regain. So thank you. Spot on. Who else? Nisha? I think it's reiterated. Never stop talking to your end consumer. You know, that's subtle, Nisha, but it's absolutely right. We were at risk for a while when we were busy focusing on selling to Walgreens and et cetera, and then selling to McKesson of losing track of the fact that the people who's signature was on our paycheck with the end consumers who were buying all this stuff all those other people for all that they would bump their chest and tell us how important they were they weren't they were just a conduit they were nothing but a pipe to get from us to the end consumer and we had to know the end consumer well so that's good maybe one more I've got two. I've got Amy and Bill. Well, <laughs> and Amy, Amy's uh, already spoken. So, Bill, you get first dibs here. I, I would say uh, you mentioned earlier that technology is not enough. So, regain was scientifically, you know, proven in, in in case studies that it was a good product, but that was simply not enough to build a business. It doesn't just magically turn into a business. Oh my God! Would somebody please? write that down, let me tape it to my wall. That's absolutely accurate. That's, people buy benefits. Most people get glassy eyed when you talk about your technology. Let me summarize a couple of things I hope I've learned. So Jared, to your point, know your customers and know what they're really buying. And what my night bite customers were really buying was security that they could sleep through the night. They would call us up in the morning and say, how do I know it worked? We'd say, well, did you wake up dead? No, well, then it worked. No, I'm being facetious. Uh, it wasn't that simple. They, were, they would test their blood glucose in the morning and it was within acceptable levels, et cetera. But what we were selling them was finally I can sleep through the night or finally my kid will sleep through the night. I don't have to worry that they're gonna die in their sleep. Also, Products that are for everyone aren't for anyone. So if somebody asks you who your product is for and you say, everybody, conversation's over, you're going to fail. Sorry, but positioning becomes imperative. This is a hard concept to get. Nobody actually needs your product or service. 
I mean, I actually don't need these glasses. What I need is to see better. So I hired glasses to help me with that job. Many of you on this call hired contact lenses, and I'm betting some of you know somebody who hired the surgeon to do the LASIK procedure. But all of us are chasing the same thing, which is the benefits. And, and Bill, to your remarks about the technology is not enough, that's absolutely right. Sell the benefits first and then bring in the technology as a reason to believe. And those of you who survived this week and are still here next Tuesday when I show up, and I expect that there will be at least 50 fewer of you by then, um, we will elaborate on this. Benefits first, then the reason to believe. I want to talk for a second about market segmentation, but I want one of you to tell me what market segmentation actually means. So who knows what that is? Nobody. Oh, well, you need me. Well, my friends, you need me. It's, uh, you know what it there's is. A, just made oh, there's a raised hand by Amy, but um, okay. I'll leave that to you, Bob. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll take it. Amy, take it away. Uh, the market segmentation is really you no know, like what exactly the target audience you are and how many how many of them out there, um, and then is any specific breakdown of different you know parts whether it's by disease or by um, age groups or like you know really kind of go down to the granular level. It's like for example, our target audience is elder centers. So there's like how many nursing homes, how many caregiver centers, how many. Is that correct? <laughs> Yes, that's, that's spot on. It's very good. And the, the major consumer packaged goods company, I don't think Procter & Gamble, the two things that they typically segment their market on are age and income, or in some cases, gender and income. And so you'll hear statements if you work in this world at all, that like, we are looking for women aged 30 to 45 with a household income that's north of $80,000 a year. Classic ways of segmenting the market. Why women? Well, because they're the ones who go to the store and buy toilet paper. And if they don't have enough money, they'll buy cheap toilet paper instead of our toilet paper. And yada, yada. It's, it's my opinion that for you guys as entrepreneurs and as innovators, that's the wrong way to segment. I think you should segment according to who is most motivated to solve this problem. Just as a quick sidebar example, I once briefly worked in the world of weight loss. We had something that worked and we had customers who were women who were a size four who did not need our weight loss product, but they thought they should be a size two. So they bought it. They were our customers because they were motivated, right or wrong, they were motivated. So say we invented something that helps you recover uh, after your first heart attack. So if you've had a heart attack and survived yesterday, today you're very concerned that you not have another heart attack. By the way, if you didn't survive, you probably aren't our customer. So, sorry. Um, so you're feeling the pain now. Now, just below that is your brother, or your sister, who says, geez, we got the same family DNA, all that stuff. And, you know, I'm worried about this. That group might buy from you as well. Below that are neighbors, friends in your bowling league or whatever who say, you know, I'm about the same age as that guy. And maybe I should start watching my cholesterol. But. Many entrepreneurs look at this big group down here and, and say things like, well, we should go where the numbers are, go where the market is. My reaction is, no, that's a graveyard. Don't do it. Find these people and start here. If you remember one slide from this talk tonight, I would encourage you to make this one be the one. Because if you find those people who are feeling the pain now, there's a couple of benefits that come from that. One is that they buy your stuff and you start building revenues, reorders, customer experience, customer validation, and cover your overhead. Two is if you find this group and you can't get them to buy it, then 
your business is dead and you need to just acknowledge it. And we work with a lot of entrepreneurs, Joe and the rest of the crew associated with this class and I, and we've come to think of it as the jockey and the horse analogy. And that you are the jockey, your business is the horse. And not every jockey rides a championship horse. And you may find over time that the horse you chose to ride is not going to win the race, in which case you should retire it or shoot it and go find another horse. Our goal is to make you a better jockey so that if this horse isn't the right one, you will win with the next one. So find these people and start there. And if you want people to change their buying habits, that takes a lot of motivation. People like their habits, things that motivate change, pain, fear, greed, vanity. But virtue, do it because it's the right thing to do. That's a tough sell. You'll get some people, but not a lot. So with Regain, obviously, what I was selling was virtue, because the only feedback they got was the doc after every six months would pat him on the back and say, you know, all your blood data is better. And they'd say, ah. <laughs> so I don't feel any different, right? With Night Bite, we help them sleep through the night. Very simple. But you could tell immediately. I'm a huge believer in marketing. I love it. There are all manner of sophisticated graduate level courses. Um, if you haven't had a chance to take one yet, I'm going to tell you the two things you absolutely have to know to be a success at marketing. And they are find out what your customers want, give it to them. People take these courses, they end up using third order polynomials for forecasting this and predicting that. That's all fine, can be useful. But if you forget these two things because you got deeply in the weeds, you've missed the point. Find out what your customers want and give it to them. Pick a couple market segments that you can dominate, launch in those markets. I had a boss that used to say this, and I've never forgiven him for it because I can't get it out of my head. But I do believe it's true. He would walk about the office and he would say, Jones, there is no hocus pocus that takes the place of focus. I think, ah, make him stop. <laughs> but it's true. It's true. Entrepreneurs are frequently accused of having attention deficit disorder. Oh, look, is that a butterfly? And, and they fail to focus. They think, oh, I've got something that's so wonderful. I can launch it here. I can launch it here. I can pick one. Focus. Follow the money. Follow the pain. So it's not sales, it's actually detective work. Instead of promoting your product or your service, it's finding your dance partner. You wanna dance with people who wanna dance with you. Sorry, Amy, I'm riffing off of your analogy here, but you want your dance partner, right? So you gotta find people who wanna dance with you. And remember that customers hire products to do a specific job, right? I hired these classes so I can see better, maybe be a little stylish. <clears throat> so design your products to do a specific job for a specific kind of customer. Go find them. And if you've done it right, the selling will be easy. So how do you do that? Well, I have to have a brief rant here because I have over and over again, the last few years, bumped into people who want to use Google ads, AdWords, et cetera, et cetera, and, and do this analytically. Well, I launched a product a couple of years ago, two and a half ounce strength, helps you sleep at night. Worked. I mean, really good science, achieve almost pharmaceutical levels of efficacy with essentially food ingredients. It was pretty cool. And we said, well, who's this for? Who's going to want it? And we assumed that it would be working moms because working moms have the hardest job on the planet. They're overworked, they're overscheduled, they're over caffeinated, 
They're fussy shoppers. They take things off the shelf. And if it says diphenhydramine as one of the ingredients, it goes back on the shelf. We said, perfect. So we went out and rented a list of 100,000 working moms who had agreed to accept these kinds of inbound emails. They shopped at Whole Foods. They had all the right prerequisites. And we sent out all this stuff and virtually every one of them told us no, not interested. Finally, a couple of them took pity on us and said, look, Bob, we don't spend any money on ourselves. We'll spend a fortune on our children buying them stuff that they don't need. We'll spend $2 on our husband. We don't spend any money on ourselves. So, and by the way, we regard sleep as a deferrable luxury. So yeah, I'm tired, but it's Tuesday. I'll make it up this weekend. I'm damn sure not spending any money on this. He said, oh my, well, I, mean, I guess thank God we got out of that with just one mail. But we noticed that there was a small group that kept ordering and kept reordering. And because we were fulfilling the orders from out of our office, because I wanted the information, I knew I was going to make any money. I wanted the information. I had all their contact data. So I called them up, said, hello, I love you. I make this stuff that you've been buying. I would love to know why you buy it. And to my surprise, out of the constellation of answers we got, every single one of them said, I run marathons. And I recover more quickly. I work out more effectively. And I perform better when I'm sleeping well. And your product helps me with that. I thought, oh, my God, moms who run. Well, why can't it be moms who do CrossFit, moms who do triathlons? In fact, why does it have to be moms? Why can't it just be people? So it was like ah, total repositioning. Here we had this product that had this sort of sensitive made with love, you know, all that stuff. No, we we're chasing warriors. Right? Go out there and conquer. So we completely redid everything. All right, back to my topic here. I would have died of old age before I smoked all of that out using AdWords and social media analytics. There is a place for that stuff, but Sometimes just talking to the customers is completely irreplaceable. You got to know how they're solving the problem. Now, who do they go to for advice? And there's a famous quote attributed to Henry Ford. Henry, did you ever ask your customers what they wanted? And he said, oh, hell, if I'd asked them, they would have said faster horses. So it was Henry's genius to realize that's called a car. So you have to, it, it takes a little bit of art to call them and actually understand what's behind what they're asking for. It's an essential skill if you want to get your positioning right. And you do have competition because if they aren't spending money now to address what you're, solve what you're addressing, it's not a problem. So you need to ask yourself, why will they think what I'm offering is better? Because your stuff isn't free. They have to pay for it. They have to go somewhere and find it. They have to go somewhere and use it. So why is your stuff in their eyes better than what they're doing now? Remember that it's not so much price, it's value. <sighs> so they might need it. They don't want it. You can't sell it. The early stage is what matters is who wants it. If you can't find them, you can't sell it. And here's a brief commercial for next Tuesday. If you can't communicate your benefits within seconds, you can't sell it. You got to be able to tell this story in 30 seconds, maybe a minute. You need to focus. This is an acquired skill. We're going to cover a bit of this next week. By the way, sooner or later, your Joe's early remarks about the 30 second elevator pitch. If you can't summarize enough in 30 seconds to arouse their curiosity, you're going to be unlikely to raise any money. So we'll do this next week because I don't think there's time tonight. So ask yourselves, where do they go for advice? Exactly how will I reach them? If you don't have any customers, paint a picture of your first customer. If you have customers, paint a picture of the one you want the most. How do I know they're going to pay for it? How much will they pay for it? Where will they go to buy it? And we need somebody who's 
mentally defective who actually enjoy sales to go out there and do that. Who's going to do it? And I'm pleased to say we have a little time. We're open for some questions from you at this point. So Fantastic. Before we move on to questions, I'm dropping an attendance form in the chat. If you can just fill that out to indicate your attendance for today and let me know if you have any problems. And that's it for me. <laughs> Thank you. We interrupt this program for a brief word from our sponsor. That would be you, Eski. I'm going to go back to that uh, presentation in a moment because I do have a summary slide. But for now, uh, the floor is open for questions. From Ravi to everyone. All right, that doesn't look like a question. All right, well. Then, Bob, yeah. do you want to try a, a pitch or two at this point, or actually, your call? If we have a couple people who are willing to have a go at it, um, oh, sorry, Robbie, got it. Um, have a go at giving a pitch. I think we do have time for a couple of them. So, if we have brave volunteers, Stephanie, was that you raising your hand? I was actually raising it in response to a question I just had. Oh, let's hear it. Um, I just the was doctor curious. Is so in. I'm a, sure, I'm a, a user experience student over at Leslie. Um, and I just had a question regarding, um, I've been reading uh, Steve Blank's books on um, Lean and and um, his, his theories with that. And, and um, Laura Klein had a book Steps on Lean. The right? epiphany and, yep. Yeah, exactly. And just kind of wondering that, like, um, if you've ever implemented lean, um, or in, have you ever done like user testing during that process and kind of where in that process you did that for the customer discovery? Uh, the answer is absolutely. In fact, we were doing it before it was named, um, because we were starving and poverty is very motivating. And, um, I, as a sidebar, I think that it's entirely possible to raise too much money in the early days. There's a certain purity of thought that comes when you're broke. Uh, so we, with this food for sleep, for example, that we worked on, uh, I ended up with a scientifically sound formulation. I paid a prototyper to make me some bottles. They were very ugly and the taste was just absolutely god awful it would have stopped a dog with rabies um, and i didn't care because i had to know that it worked and my first question therefore was does it work if it doesn't work i'm not spending a dime on making it look pretty and taste good so i found 50 brave volunteers and said here's the deal i'm going to send you a week supply no charge at the end of the week no surveys you have to talk to me five minutes, 10 minutes, everybody agreed, sent it out. A week later, called them out, every one of them, and the typical response was, God, that was awful. Do you have any more? I said, oh, <laughs> there's a there there. So let's call in the branding experts, let's call in the flavor experts, it appears it worked. So first things first, did it work? Second, oh, Actually, I left a step out. I said, I do have more, but it occurred to me that maybe they just liked it because it was free. They call me pugnacious, but I said, I do have more, but I'm not going to ship it to you for nothing, and I can't give it to you for free. You got to pay for it. Moment of truth, right? And most of them said, okay. So I thought, well, maybe I got lucky and just blundered into some people who are desperate to have better sleep. But I answered a couple questions. Does it work? And is there anybody out there besides me who's willing to pay for this thing? And then we got busy with the branding and the packaging. And we went out with a product that we thought was for working moms and figured out that was wrong. And turned it into something for athletes, connected up with the Marathon Coalition etc and proceeded to promote down that route but we did all of that with about 49 cents in the bank 
So yes, totally believe in customer validation and lean manufacturing and all those things. It's, uh, it's a recipe for sanity. Justin, I see your hand up. You have a question? Yeah, thanks for your talk. It's uh, great. Uh, I've got uh, two questions. First one is, you know, as an experienced person in marketing, finding these sort of uh, unconnected customers, what sort of resources would you, you know, direct us to, number one? And number two, if you have a startup in your building, when would you get a marketing or sales person that actually has skills in that if you don't have one in your founding team? You know, I hate hard questions. <laughs> um, well, let me start with the, the brutal part. If I don't think I can find them, then I look for my next business idea. Um, if they're that disaggregated. However, um, there are associations for almost everything out there. There's an association uh, called uh, the Heart Rhythm Society for people who have cardi who surgeons who treat cardiac arrhythmias. There's a used to be a newsletter out there for helicopter owners called Rotor and Wing. Uh, if you root around, you can usually find affiliate groups. Facebook these days has a million Facebook user groups. So I. I look for where do they aggregate. I've also found that I have to be very careful in hiring the sales and marketing person, particularly if you're hiring a salesperson. Your bullshit detector has got to be an overdrive because what do those guys sell? They sell themselves. And so they're going to come tell you they bring dead people back to life. And they'll tell you with such passion that you'll be inclined to believe them. So, um, the answer for me is to bring them in pretty early, but be very careful. And also define clearly what results you want from them so that you know it's time to say, this isn't working, sport. <laughs> you need to be successful somewhere else and cut them loose. Right. Tough question. Bob, I, I hope I that was interject? a decent answer. Yes, please. Bob, could I interject a question there? So, uh, it, it occurs to me that salespeople work well when they have a very clear target and they are, understand where to go. And early on in a venture, doesn't the founder really have to be in that discovery sales mode longer till they get to something that you think it's worth bringing someone in? I think Just the a answer is, is yes, uh, Joe, um, because Part of the fear that drives me towards success is I don't like being smoked. So I need to know enough about finance and accounting that if I hire an accountant who intends to embezzle from me, I'm going to catch it. And that sounds silly, but I, I'll tell you horror stories at some point. And I need to know that if I bring in a sales and marketing person, I'm not going to have to listen to a lot of sizzle for which there is no stake. So I think as an entrepreneur, your best bet is to do everything for a while until you learn enough about it that you can be sensible about whom you hire and then start delegating furiously. Once you've hit that critical mass, I think your job becomes getting rid of responsibilities as rapidly as possible, but they have to be to people who are better than you are. So. That's a little bit of a long-winded answer, Joe, but that's my thought. All right, I think we have time for one more. And uh, Ms. Kim? I've also got one in the chat, up. Bob. Oh. Just to add that in uh, from Wessel. He's, they say, um, is the pitch to an angel investor different from the pitch to a more proper VC? I'll let you <laughs> decide on the, the timing. I'll give a short answer, yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, and that's subject for a longer conversation and uh, Joe who's handling venture this year is that Julianne that, that is Julianne yes All right, hold that question Bill yep. 
I mean, she, she will give you a comprehensive answer and we'll have some time set aside for it. The short answer is yes, they are different. And also your presentation thing, I, I think your presentation session, you talk about that a little bit. I do. About audience. I talk a little bit and how to pitch so. to them. That's exactly right. Thank you for that reminder, actually. All right. Uh, we've got time for maybe two, three minutes. Ms. Kim, would you care to go since your hand is up? Sure. Um, so I was wondering when you're targeting um, like an unmet need and like you're identifying your customer, how do you determine whether that source is sustainable for your business? I guess um, I feel like there could be the chance where like if you identify a customer, but maybe like after a short term, you know, the customer's need is met. And so now like now like what happens so to prevent um that like how do you determine well that that should be a serious component of your business plan is it a sale where you're one and done you, you know you sell them something and they'll never need to see you again in which case you're having to constantly bring in new customers or is it a renewable process and if so how long is is the need going to last um and I almost have to answer that on a case by case basis. Um, I like businesses where they continue to reorder. To me, the holy grail of a successful startup is reorders because it tells you you've identified the need, you've met the need, you've hit a price point, you've found the customers and they're coming back for more. And now all you have to do is scale it up. Now, if you don't have one of those kinds of businesses, then when Joe brings up the presenter who talks about business module uh, models, who's that this year, Joe? Is it Rich Kevill or is it you? It's Rich, yep. Yeah. Oh, okay. It's Rich this ask, year. Ask yep. Rich yep. that question. Yep. And he will have the time to give you a proper yep. answer for it. I think another way to think of it quickly, Bob, is if you think a customer needs transportation, it's a business model issue. Are you selling them an automobile, which is maybe a once every X year thing, or are you Uber, in which it could be once a week or once a day? Different economic models, different things. That's a business model issue also. Absolutely. So. Absolutely. Yeah. All right. Well, <clears throat> excuse me. Enough about you. Let's talk about me. That was a joke, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, just before we go, um, I'm gonna be posting information and thoughts about hiring and firing and presenting ventures and et cetera, periodically in this URL. I went off and bought this domain, and mocked up a book cover and et cetera. But if you'd like to stay in touch, I probably will not be contributing any sensible content much before April or so. But if you'd like to stay in touch, just go there and join the mailing list and in the fullness of time, uh, we will be able to communicate. All right, I have a, a, a joke question for you. What are the two words that every audience most likes to hear from their presenter? In conclusion, so here we are. There's only one non-negotiable requirement if your business is gonna succeed, and that is you have to have customers. And you've got to therefore provide something that is important and unique, not to the world at large, but to someone that you can identify. Therefore, figure out who really wants your product or service, go find them, tell them about it, and take their money. Thank you very much. And do we have virtual claps on this uh, Zoom? <laughs> they well, go I can like see you guys. So you <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. It was a pleasure. I wish that we could do it live in person rather than uh, via this electronic thing, but it's better than not doing it. So thank you. Excellent. And Bob will be back next uh, week. I don't remember which day, but it's on the schedule. Tuesday. 
Tuesday at 6. Tuesday. Okay. Good. Uh, let me turn to the TAs. Any, any follow-up issues here before we wrap up the session? No issues okay. on my hand as well, long as Bob, people have filled out their forms. Okay. Good. Well, uh, Bob, uh, the check's in the mail uh, for, for another great performance. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and uh, we'll reconvene. Uh, it's still zero, I think, but uh, I owe you a, a beer when we get together or whatever. All right, that'll work. That'll work. <laughs> okay. Um, so for the uh, course, uh, we meet again tomorrow. The same, I, I believe, the same Zoom coordinates, but we're going to check that. I'm not sure whether we got everybody in attendance tonight, um, and. Uh, thank you very much. Hopefully, this first step down the six evening uh, cruise uh, has given you a lot to think about. I, uh, I've heard Bob's presentation a number of times, and every time I pick out something that reminds me that I did not do that this past year. So I think there's a lot there. Take, take and enjoy it. So with that, and unless there's anything else, I think we can call it a wrap for the evening right on time. Thank you.